welcome to Jamie DeRoy and Friends. This week we have a very special show for you. My friend and co-producer Rick McKay has been working on a Broadway trilogy. The first one was out years ago. It was shown on PBS. It's called Broadway the Golden Age. It won many, many awards. It's now out on DVD. But we have been trying to bring out the sequel, Broadway Beyond the Golden Age. And part of that is the beginnings of a chorus line. I've been bugging Rick about trying to see some of this uncut footage. He told me if I had 40 hours a week and about five or six months that I could come over and do it. Well, that sounded like an absolute job. So I stopped asking, but now he's agreed to share this footage with us. And here is some of it. Dancers were really looked upon as people that couldn't really think or talk or articulate and were relegated to creating the scenery or the backdrop for a show, but ultimately did not contribute that much to whatever a show was, you know. We were the lowest men on the totem pole, that we got paid the least amount of money, that we worked the hardest, that we busted our butts, that we got no credit, and in the end, uh, you know, no acknowledgement. That was painful. Uh, and so, you know, when fortunately we closed almost immediately, um, and that's when actually Tony and I went out and had a couple of scotches. We were at a bar and we said, we gotta do something. We've gotta do something. We went to a bar on 54th Street called the Triple Inn between Broadway and 8th. It was right around New Year's that we got together. Sean and I sat down and went, we can't do that. We cannot go through that anymore. And we drank a lot, I remember, because we knew something was happening here big, and it was like we really talked it out. We said, OK, Michonne, you want to continue your performing career. I want to focus on directing and choreographing. We have to do something for ourselves. If they don't know how to do it, we'll do it. Michelle was so great, and we, she we was Miss Secretary and write down the ideas. And I decided to try to inspire our peers, who we knew were extremely bright and multi-talented in many different ways, to want to create a company that could at least put together a show that dancers do about dancers. The original idea was to create a repertory group of dancers who did everything else, who had all those other techniques, create pieces or do other things for ourselves. So it was from the dancer's point of view. I remember meeting Tony and Michonne one time in Joe Allen about forming up a company of dancers because there wasn't enough work going around. I got a call from Michonne Peacock and Tony Stevens. And they said to me, that we, they were getting a group of dancers together because we need to take charge of our future. I had gotten a phone call from uh, Tony Stevens saying, I'm just asking people like you who've been doing Broadway and have, you know, have danced but have also acted, and you just want to be part of this and we can just talk about it. I said, sure, I'll be there. Yeah. Tony called me about the idea of getting this group of dancers together. He, they wanted the, the cream of the the crop as far as the chorus dancers. I knew that Andy Bew would be there and he was my partner in uh, On the Town, a really nice guy. And, and a, he was he and I were buddies for a while um, with that show. Uh, and he was a very good dancer. I was doing Gigi on Broadway. Tony and Michonne were getting a lot of us dancers together because he wanted to try to talk, you know, have us all talk and, and share ideas. And, and uh, I was like, well, okay, maybe, yeah. And, you know, I kind of thought about it and wasn't too sure. He and Michonne Peacock were trying to start something happening for dancers. And he was saying, maybe, you know, maybe we can get a repertory company together. We were going to try to create our own, like a, like a consortium, I guess. Where they could do productions uh, themselves and, you know, where they could have writers and, 
and directors and choreographers and th that we could all explore what we wanted to do. Like some people who like to write, they'd write the scripts. Some people who were interested in making costumes, they do the costumes. They could work on lighting if that was of interest to them or they could direct or they could act or they could dance and sing or, or whatever. I uh, didn't know who else was going to be there and I think I even asked, well Michael's going to be there, Michael Bennett's going to come down and at that piqued my interest. Michael Bennett, I'll be there. When Michael asked you to do something, you did it. When Michael calls, you go. Now it seems that a lot of other people thought, oh Michael Bennett, oh I'll, I'll, I'll be there. And I thought, oh I just don't want to go through that. that he, he would set up people to kind of compete with each other for his attention, and I thought, no, 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 I don't want to do that. I call Tommy and I go, Tommy, are you going? He'll go, yeah, Michael Bennett's going, I might as well go. That's why we went to Michael. We went to Michael because we knew he had power and people wanted to work for him and that there would be interest. And I thought, well, you know what? I think I'm in a healthy enough place in my life that I can handle it. So that was my approach to going to that fateful evening. Uh, Sandal Bergman is my dance partner in Gigi. It was just the smoothest. I mean, we felt great together. And I really, really liked her. And that's probably as much as I should say. Because I, I was, I wasn't too sure if I was going downtown for this thing with Michael Bennett. It was like, I could be here with Sandal. But nothing happened. Because Sandal changed my life by saying, Andy, get downtown. If Michael wants you down there, go down there and do it. And I went, yeah. So I did. And we all met at midnight one night. We went over to Tommy's house. Probably smoked a joint, right? We went over there to get stoned. Kelly Bishop was there. I'll say yes to that. <laughs> that would be usually the way we would do things. And uh, we got pretty looped. We were a party group. It was it was the 70s, and um, we would go out, and we were all all went together. We piled into a cab, and I remember it was just snowing. Right. I just remember, you know, us meeting each other after our shows and getting in a cab and going down to some studio downtown, some dance studio over on the east side. It was downtown somewhere, a studio. Downtown First Avenue and way east side someplace. I know it was on the east side, it was in the 20s someplace. I remembered it being like 23rd or 22nd Street and 3rd Avenue. Michonne had, had, had mentioned it to me and I was like the go-to guy if you wanted a studio because um, at, at that time the business that we had, we had uh, maybe four or five studios around New York. And it was upstairs. But it's always upstairs. It's always up a steep and very narrow stairway, you know. Second floor above a pharmacy. We had a really, really nice studio. Over Dunkin' Donuts. Uh, a snowy place. night. And when I got there, there was Candy, Chris. I was doing Pippin. Kelly Bishop, who at that point in time, we were not friends, and she was very scary. I wanted all the men to be in love with me and all of the women to be afraid of me. <laughs> you know, she was that lady in the red shoes with her red hair and... Intimidating. Ah! I figured if I scared them first, they wouldn't scare me later. That was really what that was all about. Well, first of all, I probably did think I was better because I really, I was a really good dancer. I mean, I could pretty much outdance everybody. The only one that made me uncomfortable was Pam Souza. I thought she danced as well as I did, and that was like really hard. But that's my ego. Doing two shows of Pippin and then going over to take a dance class at midnight. That was what I thought we were going to do. I didn't know about Michael and I didn't know about this whole other agenda and I was like kind of um, intimidated I think by the room because I didn't know anybody except Candy. And there were about, I don't know, 23, 24 of us, something. Here we were with people you knew, you were with people you didn't know, you were with people you liked, maybe people you didn't like. And all these people that I knew from auditions, you know, that I'd written off for whatever reason, oh that got me. Oh, that, uh, oh, her. Mm. But the one common denominator that we did know is we were dancers. And that's the first thing that we did was dance. First we danced, because that's what we all had in common. And then suddenly we're dancing, and you think, why are we dancing? Oh, all right. 
thought I thought we were gonna come and put together like uh, talk about putting together a company of people being creative in other fields. Mm. And Tony was starting to teach a class, and I was like, why am I here taking a class? I just finished doing two shows. I got another show tomorrow. Uh, I don't think this is gonna work out. I think Tony maybe led part of it. Tony gave the first class. Um, and we sweat. I was just about ready to leave and that's when Michael came in and said, hey everybody. And then in the middle of us dancing, in comes Michael Bennett with Donna McKechnie and then it's a like, oh, what is this? Is this an audition? When he came in, all of a sudden, there would be, oh, what is this? Is this an audition? What are we doing? Nobody knew. And Michael was wearing a coyote parka, big, huge fur, and this little man. And Donna was wearing, I don't know, something furry. I do remember it like heightening the whole experience. Because it was Michael Bennett and Donna was with him. Who was Donna to you then? I, I had known Donna first in Promises, Promises when she was a principal performer. Michael Bennett, you know, created Tricky Lurky really for her. She had never done chorus when I'd known her at all. And I mean, I knew that she was, she and Michael were like a team. Or that you know he was her mentor and, and protector, and I didn't know that Donna had been invited. I thought I knew Michael had been. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Now this is all about chorus people and Donna McKechnie is here. Okay, this is all, okay, fine. Michael was smart enough to kind of like bring us all to be one. You know, me, I was just a freshman. I had only done like uh, three Broadway shows or something, and and there were others in the room that had done six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And Michael, I think, said, hey, everybody, what are we doing? Let's go in the other room. We're going to go sit down and talk. I went, good. But then after we danced, then, you know, we went into this room. This other smaller room, which was more like a yoga room. This back studio that I had, which was carpeted, um, it had one window. And it, um, it, was, it, it was comforting. Michael said, Okay, we're all going to sit, everybody, we're going to have a big circle here. Everybody just find a place to sit down. And uh, he was in the sort of back part of the room from the door. When we all literally sat around in a half circle. No circle, not a semicircle, a full circle. We're sitting in a circle. A big, long, oblong circle. Michael was up against the wall over here. And Michael Bennett says, um, I think the dancers have a story to tell. And um, I'm going to ask you some questions and I'm gonna tape them. Yeah, it's my old reel-to-reel -reel Sony tape deck that I carried and had, the top was two speakers that I used to use for uh, class and for other things, and so that, that was it, click. So yes, he, he went through, he said he had the tape recorder, he wanted to be very honest, he gave a nice little speech about, I'm just trying to find this, I don't know what we have here. They were about our childhood, and. Da, 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 da. And each one of us was going to answer these the same question, basically, and go around the room. They said, we're going to talk about your life from a child up to the time you got to Broadway. And one by one, he asked us, how did you get into show business? Uh, why? What was your first job? You don't have to answer anything you don't want, but whatever you do say, just be honest. So I'll ask a question and I'll go first. So he would always ask the question and then he would answer. And Michael said, I'll go first. So Michael went first. And pretty much like the way the show goes, Michael started off and he would say, well, I grew up in Buffalo. And, and the next person would say, I grew up here. And the next person, and we would go around. And he did this thing about, oh, and, and but the women don't have to give their ages. And I went, wait a minute. I said, you just went to do it through this whole speech about honesty and openness and equality and the whole thing. I said, why shouldn't the women give their ages? Well, I, a couple of them blanched. And I did learn that there were a couple of people, uh, women who were older than I thought they were. It was very funny. And you went, ah. Oh, I see why. When it got to me, I, I said something amazing, like I gave my name, my real name, with my middle name, which I really hate. I was born in Colorado Springs, Colorado, February 28, 1944. And I'm going to be 30 real soon. And I'm real glad. That's what I said. He was so honest and so um, forthcoming that 
everyone just kind of shed their, um, their fears and they went, well, Michael's talking like this and so honestly in front of all these people, then we can do the same thing. He was very open. I mean, he was honest. He was remarkable in some of the things he would divulge about himself. And what would happen is in the middle of somebody's story, somebody else would say, oh my God, that happened to me. Or, oh, that, I totally understand that. Or, you know, people would laugh because we all had, you know, that same experience. Talked about my childhood from the, from the Bronx and that, uh, you know, I used to run with my tap shoes. Part of that little thing where I used to run with my tap shoes from the baseball field to Ellesmere Dance Hall where Lily Pons was and taught me how to tap dance. The story, I Can Do That, is my story. It's one of the stories that I told the night, night of the tape session. Um, my sister went to dancing school, and when she stopped going to dancing school, I kept going to dancing school. Michael found, more than not, that, that we, there were common experiences. So those were the stories that, that interested him, because if three and four people could, have, could see the red shoes and get inspired by the red shoes, then we got to put the red shoes in there. If six people said, I can do that, when I saw my, you know, then we got to put, I can do that in there. Of course, we were all devastated by Nick Dante's story. You know, it was really so sad. He had a way of putting the words together from his heart, you know. So, but that night, I mean, it was like, all right. That was quite, that was amazing. I mean, it's practically verbatim from that night, the Paul monologue. In fact, I would say it's not pretty much, I'd say it is verbatim. And what we call the Ron Don character, Ron Coleman's character was patterned after uh, Andy Bew. That's right. That's, That's right. why my stories um, are in six different characters, or some bits of my life are in six different characters. For me, it was very stressful because I'd never been to a shrink. You know, and most of the people that really talked had been, you know, to psychiatry, they had, they had been to some therapists here. By the time you got midway, you went, oh God, there's like eight more to go. It was horrible. It was, we call it the Towering Inferno. I think it was like 25, 30 people that, who were there. I'm hearing all these people. <laughs> Something that was special about people like Donna and Priscilla, they had gone through therapy like Michael had gone through therapy. And by the time it got to me, I'm feeling like, I can get out there and say. So it was really, it became a therapy session. And I remember saying to them, is this some kind of group therapy thing? I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know? I don't want to do that. It was a big fucking therapy session. That's basically what it was. It was group therapy. So my defense was being flip and funny. But someone like Priscilla and Donna, I mean, they just kind of, and Michael, they, that was very easy for them to do that group therapy kind of thing because they had done it. And then, knowing that my sister was there and they're asking these childhood questions of which, you know, she absolutely damaged me as a child. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I didn't want to reveal this and you know, make her feel badly. And it was like a floodgate because all of us just like were pouring our souls out. People were just talking. They were talking from their souls. I remember Renee crying a lot and that was really irritating. <laughs> Every time I would try to explain something, if I was the least bit emotionally connected to whatever I was trying to say, I would cry. She so cried all cry. the time. I wanted to kill her. In those days, I used to cry at the drop of a hat. <laughs> I just uh, wanted to kill her. I know I'm a good talker now, but I, I never used to be. There were some people that could hardly speak at all. There were other people that would um, break down in tears because they had a wonderful life. I listened to these stories. And one by one, they would say, well, I had to run away from home to be in show business, or I had to sneak my ballet shoes into the bag, or um, I had to dance to get out of my house because it was so crazy, or, you know, all these stories. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I must sound like Leave It to Beaver or something because I was like, well, my parents are just happy that I'm happy. Her father was a, a captain of... of the army and she was a cheerleader and um, she got all straight A's and there was no alcohol or drugs in her family and you know and we would find ourselves like all running to Candy Brown and hugging her because she had a great life and the other 25 of us had you know a trying unusual dramatic kind of childhood but there was one person in there that had a normal 
healthy childhood. And I thought, I'm kind of a disappointment. Here I am, the black kid. I should have some struggle, some ghetto I came out of, and you know, <laughs> you know and I didn't have it, <laughs> you know. And they went. We went around and around and around, and we went around. And I think it was like three o'clock and four or something, five or seven o'clock or something. It was like we went all around. We left in the morning. We started at 12 midnight and we ended at 12 o'clock noon. All night we went. And so they, if you notice, most of the people, of course all my compatriots are probably going to hate me, but this is just my perception, gang, is that the ones that, you know, really got a lot of dialogue in the show, just talking, 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 talking. Talked and talked and talked, diary of the mouth they had. There was just a feeling that night that, that, um, People somehow let their guard down and talked about their childhoods in, a, in very open ways. Look at this, I am gonna cry. Damn it, I said I wasn't gonna cry. But it was very touching. That evening it was filled with such raw emotion and raw feeling. Even though I was exhausted, I was so high just from this incredible experience. We didn't know where it was gonna go, but. but it was so interesting and it was so emotional and uh, there was such a kind of sense of love and trust. No matter what relationship you had with the people in the room, whether you were the rival, you were jealous of them, you were you know, lovers with them, no matter what, we all knew at that moment that we were all dancers and you cannot explain the experience of dancing, unless you dance. Many of them had very similar stories, um, and uh, it just, everything melted. It just melted away, you know? You felt closer to them because you just didn't know them as a dancer. You knew something about their history, their growing up. And I came out caring for people very much, as opposed to when I went in, not really wanting to spend a whole lot of time with some of those people in there. And I knew them all, and they changed me, they turned me, and I felt compassion, I really did. I remember that very clearly. I remember Candy starting to cry, and me quelling up, and people got, were incredible. There was this gestalt of emotion that happened that was extraordinary. No one was on that evening. It came out for the first time as it was happening. There were things that people were talking about that never told anyone. Things were coming out for the first time. It was just, it was an amazing story. Evening, 11 and a half hours. Basically, it ended up being about 12 hours. Anyway, that's how it first started, and that was all taped. And basically, what you see up on that stage of a chorus line are those tape sessions. We are the authors, no matter what, because the genesis is almost word for word what we said that night. Down to what do you do when you can't dance anymore? It is the show. I was so moved that anything that I could do in, in my life that would be put into a play, a musical, for other people to see and to do and to, and having no idea that it would have such a far-reaching, you know, effect in 23 different countries. Still now, I mean, you know, it's playing all over, you know. So there was a church close by, and the Angelus started ringing. So bells started ringing. I remember the church bell tolling because it was on the hour someplace. And then we went out into this quiet city that was all snowy, and Michonne and I took this taxi back up to the west side and we're elated and excited and wow, you know, and still not knowing, still not knowing what it was going to be, but knowing that that evening was pretty, pretty special. I had no idea, we had no idea that anything like this was going to occur. I can't imagine anybody did. I just think it was the right people at the right time. It was just. It was just uh, meant to be. <laughs> I've said this a million times. By Arc she wasn't called. 
I called her. <laughs> uh, I do want to say that I was invited. Um, and I did not want to go. She, she was like one of the first on the list, you know. And I called her and she said, I don't want to sit around and hear a bunch of old gypsies complain about their careers. I thought, you know, why do I want to listen to, you know, all these dancers whining about, you know, their, what they're going to do uh, when they're out of work. Sorry, Bayark, I called you. <laughs> but Michael didn't call me. This wasn't, this is, wasn't a Michael thing. So um, I didn't go. I'll never forget it. So she spent the rest of her life. The rest doing of her it. life doing it. So sorry, Bayark. <laughs>